Charles Spurgeon once said these words concerning the very concept of work, of labor. He said, man was not made for an idle life. Labor is evidently his proper condition. Even when man was perfect, he was placed in the garden not to admire its flowers, but to keep it and to dress it. If he needed to work when he was perfect, much more does he require the discipline of labor now that he has fallen. Work is always healthier for us than idleness. It is always better to wear out shoes than sheets. There is no shame about any honest calling. Don't be afraid of soiling your hands. There's plenty of soap to be had. Good words. Spurgeon was right. God created us to work. He created us not to be inactive, but he created us to work. And for a Christian, for those of us who know Christ, that work, regardless of our vocation, involves intentionally sharing the gospel with unbelievers. God has called everyone who knows Christ as their Lord, their Savior, to the work of proclaiming the gospel. And I understand, while some are called into full-time Christian work, not all, but while some are called into full-time Christian work, all believers, though, are called to be full-time Christians. And therefore, that entails serving Him, serving your Lord by being His witnesses. And when one thinks about this, when you stop and you pause and you actually ponder this, that the Lord has called any of us to work for him, it is not only remarkable, it's also a bit puzzling. And I say it's a bit puzzling because God doesn't actually need us to do his work since he can do it himself, and he can do it obviously far better than we can. In fact, when you think about it, the Lord could have painted the message of the gospel in the sky for all to see, or he could have used angels to proclaim the message of salvation, and as we know, they would have done a far better job than we do. But instead, as the Apostle Paul points out in 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent him to the world primarily by proclaiming the gospel because Paul went on to say he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We tell people how to be reconciled to God, which is the gospel message. So why did God do it this way? Why did he entrust something as important as, as gospel proclamation to, to weak, fallible, oftentimes fickle and unfaithful people like us? Well, he hasn't told us why. He hasn't told us why he's entrusted such important kingdom work to us, only that this is the way he has chosen to do it. And this morning, as we continue our study of the Gospel of Luke, we've come to a passage where not, we're not only told about Christ's followers doing his work of proclaiming him and his kingdom, but we're told how Jesus specifically instructed them on how to carry out his work of gospel proclamation. The passage I'm referring to is Luke chapter 10. We're now in a new chapter, Luke chapter 10. I want to read to you verses 1 through 16. It is the passage in its entirety, though we will not be able to cover all of it today, but here's what we read. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Whoever, whatever house you, you enter, first say, peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you. And heal those in it who are sick. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. 
I say to you, it will be more tolerable on that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the, in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You'll be brought down to Hades. The one who listens to you listens to me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Now, I, I want to point out a few observations from this passage that I think will help give you a better understanding of God's message in these verses. First of all, I want you to know that although some of these verses sound very similar to what we read at the beginning of Luke chapter 9, in fact, you might think, isn't this a duplicate? It's not. What we read in, in Luke chapter 9 is the, the Lord sending out his 12 apostles on a short-term missions trip to the area of Galilee to the villages, to the towns of that region. But this ministry is different because this is a different mission which, which actually entails a different group of witnesses. You see, unlike the opening verses of chapter 9, these opening verses here in Luke chapter 10 aren't about the 12 apostles being sent into the region of Galilee, but rather they're about a, a different and a larger group of Christ followers, 70 of them being sent by the Lord into the region of Judea to those towns and villages where Jesus would eventually be visiting. And that's because this new evangelistic work by these 70 disciples took place after Jesus had finished his ministry in the area of Galilee so that he's now on the road. He's traveling in and around the area of Judea until he finally will arrive at his destination, the city of Jerusalem. The second observation I would point out to you concerning this passage is about the terminology that Jesus uses in commissioning these 70 disciples to communicate the truth about him to the people that they were to speak to. In verses 9 and 11, he tells them that they are to say, the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. So what did the Lord mean by this? Well, the basic concept of a, of a kingdom is that of a sphere or a realm where a king rules. That's why it's called the kingdom. Now, the kingdom of God has a number, <coughs> number of different aspects because God is king over every realm of, of life. He's king over all creation. He's king over the nations of the world. Therefore, he's king over all unsaved people, even though they don't recognize him. But he still is king, and it's his kingdom. However, the way Jesus is using this term kingdom of God here in Luke chapter 10 is a reference to salvation in him. Because those who trust him as savior, they come under his authority as their king. So when he says the kingdom of God has come near to you, he means that salvation is near because he, the king and Messiah, he's near. In other words, he's telling them that he, the Messiah, the king, is present with them. And he's offering them salvation through the message that his 70 disciples are proclaiming about him. So in essence, then, the, the preaching of the kingdom of God is the preaching of the gospel. The same message that we proclaim to unsaved people today. Yes, we give more details because we know more about the cross. But in essence, it's the same message that Jesus is king He's, he's Lord, and that those who trust him for salvation are not only forgiven of their sins, but upon believing they are transferred from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's dear son. That's the second observation. A third observation about this passage is that it is connected to, and it flows out of the last few verses that we read about in Luke chapter 9. You'll recall about the three men who were not ready to be committed loyal followers of Christ. See, Luke is the only gospel writer to tell us about Jesus sending out these 70 disciples. And the reason, the reason he inserts this story right here at the beginning of chapter 10 is because he wants us to know that while there are some who made excuses as to why they could not follow Jesus, 
There also was a rather large group of 70 men who were committed followers of Christ. Men who made no excuses as to why they, they couldn't leave everything and everyone to follow him. See, unlike the three men who really were not true followers, these 70 individuals, they are true followers of Jesus. Men who without any reservation obey the Lord's call to follow him on this important mission into Judea. As one Bible teacher described these 70 followers of Christ, who in contrast to some others did not refuse his call to discipleship, he said this, he said, the 70 were willing to deny themselves, take up their crosses daily and follow him. Exactly what Jesus said a true disciple has to do. <laughs> Finally, the fourth observation I would point out to you about this passage is that these 70 disciples of Jesus were just ordinary men. They were not professional clergy. They weren't rabbis of synagogues. Listen, they were not even full-time ministers like the 12 apostles. They were just 70 ordinary guys who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They were men who, who loved him. Men who therefore were willing to follow and obey, and obey him, even if it meant being uncomfortable by going into towns and villages that they just were not familiar with. I want you to keep in mind that, that these men were all from the area of Galilee. They were from Galilee. But now, now they're following Jesus into a whole new area. The, the region of Judea and surrounding areas in towns and villages that they were that were unknown to them, that were unfamiliar to these men. So they're out of their comfort zones. But because they loved the Lord, they were willing to follow him regardless of how uncomfortable they might be. And folks, because they were just ordinary followers of Christ, being instructed by Jesus as to how to serve him and proclaiming the message of salvation, what we read here about these men doing the Lord's kingdom work are truths that are transferable to us. They're transferable to us, his present day ordinary followers. You see, everything we will read about in these verses concerning the Lord's instructions to these 70 disciples doing kingdom work, in principle, in principle, they are applicable, applicable to us as we witness for Christ today. So from these four observations that this Evangelistic work is not a duplicate of the apostles' short-term missions trip into Galilee, but rather a distinct new ministry involving 70 disciples in Judea, and that kingdom work is essentially the work of sharing the gospel, and that these 70 men are, unlike the three at the end of chapter 9 who refuse to follow Christ, they are committed and loyal to Jesus, and that the Lord's instructions about these 70 men going about doing kingdom work are all relevant, practical, pertinent, and applicable for us. Knowing all of this, we're now ready to delve into our text. And what we find before us in these verses is that in sending out these 70 disciples of his, Jesus gives them very specific instructions on how to do his work. Kingdom work. The work of proclaiming the need to enter his kingdom of salvation. And these instructions, all, as I said, transferable, all pertinent for us, reveal a number of responsibilities. All kingdom workers, that's us, have been given by Jesus as we serve him in proclaiming him. So you might want to write these notes down in this outline. Today we're going to look at two of these responsibilities. The first one being this, kingdom workers are to pray for more kingdom workers. Kingdom workers are to pray for more kingdom workers. Verse 1. <coughs> now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Now Luke begins this passage by simply telling us these words. Now after this... The Lord appointed 70 others. And what he means by these words, now after this, is that the appointing of these 70 men took place after Jesus had closed his ministry in Galilee. He's over with that ministry. He's moved on. In other words, soon after leaving Galilee for the area of Judea, 
He chose 70 of his disciples to send out to do a specific work for him, and Jesus sent them out in pairs, two by two, to go ahead of him to every town, every city, every place in Judea where he was soon to come. Now, all that Luke is doing here, he's just setting the scene for us. But what he has told us has caused people to ask two questions. So let's deal with those. Question number one, why did Jesus choose the specific number 70 to send out? And two, why did Jesus send them out in pairs of two? Well, concerning the first question, why did Jesus choose to send out 70 of his followers? The answer is, we don't know. How's that for you? We don't know because we have not been told. The text does not tell us why. In fact, we don't even know for certain if this number was actually 70 or 72 because certain old Greek manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke say 70 and others say 72 and therefore it is just not clear which manuscripts, which of the manuscripts reflect the original text of Scripture. Scholars are actually divided on which number they think is the right one. Now, whether or not Jesus sent out 70 or 72, it isn't really that important. However, you might be interested to know that some Bible teachers have suggested that the reason that Jesus sent this particular number, 70, let's say, is to reflect that Moses What Moses did when he chose in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, he chose 70 elders to help him in governing Israel. So it's very possible that is the answer, but we don't know for certain. In any case, the fact that 70 or 72 were committed followers of Jesus, what it does reveal is that there were more than than 12 apostles who were his followers. That's what it does reveal. Even though the nation of Israel as a whole rejected Christ, There were many individuals in the land who believed that Jesus was the Messiah and they were loyal followers of his. Now concerning the second question, why did Jesus send these men out in pairs of two rather than just sending them out as lone witnesses by themselves so as to double their evangelistic efforts? The text again doesn't say. But most likely, folks, the reason the text doesn't say why is because it's so unnecessary to say anything because, frankly, sending them out as a team is just common sense. See, these men were sent out in pairs because the Lord knew that this would be a hard mission. And therefore, traveling in twos, they would be able to encourage one another, be able to support one another. As I said, this is just common sense that you would think would be obvious to all, but that's not the case. Apparently, it is not the case, and I tell you why I know this. Many years years ago, when Michelle and I were visiting Australia, we met a Christian couple who at one time had been involved in a cult commonly known as two-by-twos. The cult has another name, but they're commonly known two-by-twos. Why? Because their ministers always traveled in pairs, two by two, always. That was part of their doctrine. And though this couple had been converted to Christ and they had left this cult, they were absolutely obsessed, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, obsessed with wanting to know why I thought that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. And the whole time that Michelle and I spend time with them, they just kept asking us about about this the the whole time. Now, what they should have been concerned about is a lot of other things, because if you ever looked up this cult, you would see that they were heretical, especially on the doctrine of salvation. But the one thing that kept bothering them was this question of Jesus sending his disciples out two by two. So we would be talking, having a nice conversation, and the man would break in, and he'd say, But why? Why would Jesus do this? And no matter what I said, it did not seem to satisfy him. Now, why this couple was so hung up on this question, I don't know. But the reason that Jesus did it this way, the reason he sent the 70 out in pairs of two, it's simply because as King Solomon stated in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, two are better than one. 
Here's what Solomon wrote. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Bible teacher and pastor Chuck Swindoll, before entering the ministry, he served as a Marine. And based on what he learned in the Marines, he said the following in explanation of the Lord's wisdom in sending his followers out two by two. Chuck Swindoll said this. He said, we were taught in the Marines that when you dig a foxhole before a battle, always dig it big enough for two men. Two men fighting in the trenches strengthen and encourage each other. They maintain level heads. They're more efficient in fighting and have a much better chance for survival. One warrior in combat, however, can easily become discouraged and retreat from the fight. In pairs, in pairs, the workers enjoy the benefits of companionship, protection, affirmation, and encouragement. He's absolutely right. And so, having set the scene for us that sometime soon after departing Galilee for Judea, Jesus sends out 70 or 72 of his followers into the towns and places that he was going to come. And he sent them out in teams of two. As Luke continues now, he tells us about the very specific instructions that Jesus gave to these men before sending them forth on this mission. And the first thing he told them to do as kingdom workers is to pray. Verse 2. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, it's helpful to understand that these words of instruction that Luke tells us Jesus gave to his disciples before sending them out, understand they're in summary form. There's a lot more to this. This is just a brief summation of what he said. The Lord clearly went into far more detail than what Luke actually records here. But what Luke records for us sums up our Lord's words, and God says they are sufficient for us. We get the gist of it. This is what he wants us to know. Now the Lord begins <coughs> his instruction by using an image in the world from the world of agriculture. He told those he was about to send out that the harvest, he said, the harvest is plentiful. So what did the Lord mean by this? Well, although at other times Jesus used the term harvest to speak of the ingathering, gathering sinners for the final judgment, there's nothing in this context to indicate that this is what he meant here. It seems best to understand our Lord's words as meaning that there were multitudes of people out there in the area of Judea <coughs> who were ready to enter his kingdom. However, while there were many who were ready to enter his kingdom because their hearts had been prepared by God to accept Christ, the laborers who were needed to tell them the gospel were few. In other words, Jesus was saying that there are so few individuals willing to reach out to these people with the message about him and help them help lead these people into his kingdom. Now, let me pause for a moment because lest anyone be troubled by the fact that there are people whom God has chosen, God has prepared, God has elected for salvation, individuals who are ready to enter his kingdom, but so few believers willing to reach out to them to tell them how to enter his kingdom. Lest you be troubled by this, you need to keep in mind that scripture teaches that all who are chosen, all who are sovereignly chosen by God, all the elect, without exception, will come to faith in Christ. And none will be lost, regardless of whether or not someone actually verbally shares with them the message of the gospel. Paul said these magnificent words in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. He said, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, Paul says that all whom God has 
predestined, which essentially means he's, he's chosen them. He's predestined, meaning those he's predestined to be saved. He also called to himself, meaning he effectively and successfully called them to come to him for salvation, and they came. And those he called, those who came to him, he justified, meaning that because they did come to Christ for salvation, they were justified by faith, which means God has declared them righteous. And finally, those who he justified, Paul says, he also glorified as if in the past tense, which means that God guarantees that they will go to heaven And when they do, they'll be given a glorified body when they die. So all the elect, these two verses reveal, will make it to heaven. All will be glorified. As far as God is concerned, it's already happened. Without exception. But if the laborers are so few, then how does this work? What if someone doesn't witness to an elect individual? How will they hear about Christ if someone doesn't verbally communicate the gospel? To them. Well, the fact that there are so few believers who are actually actively and intentionally and aggressively engaged in evangelism, that doesn't limit God. Though we are all commanded, commanded to share the gospel with others, God is not dependent on us being obedient to the task of evangelism to save people. Now, we do know this. We we do know that the only way, without exception, the only way that people are saved is by knowing the message of the gospel so that they can place their faith in Christ. Because Romans 10, verse 17, emphatically says this. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So a person cannot be saved without hearing the truth about Christ and salvation. We know that. However, However, how God communicates The words about Christ and salvation, that's up to him. You see, some come to faith in Christ just by reading the Bible. Nobody personally witnessed to them. They just read in the Bible about Jesus and salvation, and they were saved. That's actually what happened to me. I was reading through the Gospel of Matthew, and the Lord used his word to bring me to faith. Others are are saved by hearing a sermon on the radio or in church or over the internet. And some are saved because they've read a gospel tract or a book uh, that explains salvation in Christ. My friend Phil Johnson was saved by reading a gospel tract that someone threw on the ground and discarded. He picked it up, read it, and was saved. See, God isn't limited in how he saves the elect. In spite of the fact that the laborers are few, the elect, all of them, will always come to faith in Christ because God will make sure that they get the message of his word one way or another. But having said that, we need to understand that although he brings the elect to salvation by any means that he sovereignly chooses, the primary way, the primary way that he brings people into his kingdom is by his servants, individual Christians, us, evangelizing the lost by telling them the message of the gospel. This is our God-given responsibility. We are to witness to the lost, not shove it down their throats, but graciously as God opens the door, witness to them. And that's why after telling them the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, Jesus said to these 70 disciples of his, therefore, because this is the case, therefore beseech, which, which essentially means plead, plead, Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In other words, pray to the Lord, the one, the one responsible to bring this harvest of souls into his kingdom. Pray to him that he'll raise up and send out laborers into his harvest. That is to say, in light of the fact that there are multitudes of people out there ready to enter his kingdom, but so few laborers to help them enter, ask the Lord to send, to send forth into his field, laborers who share the gospel with them. You see, what Jesus was telling these 70 disciples of his, and what he is still saying to us today, is that we are responsible not only to witness to unsaved people, but we are responsible, watch this, to pray for the Lord to raise up his servants to share the gospel with those who are lost. What a beautiful display of the balance 
between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Because God is sovereign, as Lord of the harvest, he will be sure to save those whom he has chosen to save. And yet, we, we're responsible, not only to be his witnesses to lead people to Christ, but to pray that the Lord will raise up more witnesses who will lead others to Christ. You see, Jesus commands us, commands, not a suggestion, commands us, every one of us, not only to pray for lost people to be saved, and I hope you do that, but also to include in our prayers that we are praying that there'll be more Christians who will be obedient to share the gospel with lost people. And there are a number of ways to apply this to our lives. So, so note this. One way, one way is to pray for the Lord to raise up more full-time missionaries who will commit themselves to serving the Lord overseas and here at home. Our friend Paul Davis, who along with his wife Karen, has served the Lord as a missionary in France for many, many years. As long as I've been in the pastorate here, that's how long he's been on the field. Paul has expressed his concern that there are so few Christians these days who are actually preparing to be full-time missionaries. Young people just aren't going to Bible colleges like they used to, to be trained as missionaries. When Michelle and I were at Moody Bible Institute, Missions was a large, large major with many young people in that major preparing to go and be missionaries. So this is something specifically that you and I need to be praying for. And keep in mind, when you pray like this, it is possible that God will answer your prayer by calling you into full-time missions. Over the years, there have been a number of people from Lakeside who have sensed the call of God into full-time missions. They sat where you're sitting, and God called them to go into missions. They're now on the mission field. In fact, most of our missionaries that we support are people who came out of Lakeside. There are a few exceptions, but most of them are people who came out of Lakeside. So pray that the Lord will raise up more missionaries abroad and here at home. But praying for more kingdom workers also means praying for more Christians to take an active role in serving the Lord in their local churches. And that includes what Jason Bruns told us last week concerning the need for more teachers and helpers in our own children's ministry. That's all part of it. This is the field. This is the harvest. So pray for more kingdom workers for our own children's ministry as well as other evangelistic outreaches of our church. You can do that. This is a discipline, not only to pray, but pray for more laborers, more laborers here, more laborers overseas. It's really a simple thing to do, to pray for the Lord to raise up laborers. But so few Christians do this. This is what Jesus commands us to do. So if you love him, you're going to, if you didn't know it, up to now, you're going to need to obey him by making it a regular part of your prayer life to beseech the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest. And it may be that he'll call you to do this. So having instructed the 70 to pray for more kingdom workers, as we continue reading, we see that Jesus gave the 70 loyal followers of his, he gave them still a second responsibility, another responsibility, which is that kingdom workers are to be totally dependent upon him. Verse 3, go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Having just told them to pray for more kingdom workers, Jesus now tells his 70 disciples, he tells them to go, indicating the urgency of the mission. Go, go. In other words, because there's a multitude of people out there ready to enter my kingdom, I'm sending you out to them with evangelistic urgency. Just go. But before actually sending them into the various towns and villages of Judea, he wants them to first understand what they're actually getting into. So he tells them that their mission is dangerous. It's a dangerous mission. It's dangerous because they'll be like weak helpless lambs in the midst of 
hungry, savage wolves. In other words, they'll be like sheep amongst a pack of, of bloodthirsty wolves ready to pounce on them. Now, the wolves that Jesus is referring to here, they're not literal wolves, but they are individuals who are hostile towards Christ, hostile towards the gospel. They are unsaved people who are bent on harming Christ's sheep, his followers, harming them both physically and emotionally. They attack the message of the gospel, and at times they attack the messengers of the gospel. And so Jesus warns them that they'll be very vulnerable to the attack of these savage wolves. Some of them, no doubt, would find themselves facing persecution in Jewish synagogue courts of law. Others, persecution by secular authorities, and still others would be rejected by family members, relatives who, who lived in the area of Judea. And folks, nothing has really changed over the last 2,000 years. The Lord's servants were still lambs in the midst of bloodthirsty wolves who loved to attack, persecute, and try to discredit Christ's servants and the message of the gospel. <laughs> Serving Christ, especially when you are a consistent witness for him, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And it's dangerous because armed with the message of the gospel, you're a threat to Satan. You're a threat to his kingdom of darkness. And so he, he, sends, he sends his devilish agents to attack you, sometimes with slander and sometimes with actual physical violence. <coughs> On another occasion, Jesus warned his disciples of the persecution that they could expect to receive. He said these now familiar words, I've read this to you many times, John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. He said, if the world hates you, and the thought here is not, well, the world might hate you. If they do, no, the thought is, since they do hate you. So, so let's translate it that way. Since the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Now, the fact that unbelievers hate you and will persecute you and will try to make life miserable for you, it doesn't mean, though, that you have to cower in fear. And it definitely doesn't mean that you have to shirk your responsibility to aggressively share the gospel, even though this does mark you out as a specific target for these wolves, sort of puts a, a bullseye on your back, but don't cower in fear and don't shirk your responsibility. You see, what gives us courage and sustains us in dangerous situations is that we know who's sending us. We're not there on our own. We would never do this on our own. We're being sent. Who's sending us? It's our shepherd. It's Jesus. He said, go, behold, I send you out. That's why you're going. I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. In other words, he's telling them that they aren't out there witnessing to people on their own. They're, they're not alone. He, their shepherd, has sent them, his weak and helpless lambs, into battle with merciless wolves. And therefore, as their shepherd, he will be with them, he'll watch over them, he'll protect them, he'll sustain them, he'll comfort them, he'll encourage them, even when they are attacked. See, what Jesus wants his 70 followers to realize is that, although, yes, it's true, they are in very dangerous situation as lambs amongst wolves. They're not alone. He's there. The shepherd is with the lambs to protect them, and they really need to rely upon him and depend upon him. And folks, the same holds true for us today. Jesus is with you as you encounter people who are hostile to the gospel, and he wants you to trust him. He wants you to rely upon him. He wants you to depend upon him to give you the, the right words to say, the right attitudes of response to opposition, and to sustain and protect you even as you face dangerous opposition 
and hostility from unbelievers. And to make sure that these 70 understand just how much they, they actually need to depend upon him, not only for safety, but also for all their sustenance, all their provisions, Jesus states these words in verse 4. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet, and greet no one on the way. Now, just as the Lord had instructed the apostles to travel light when he sent them out on their short-term missions trip into Galilee, so now he sends these 70 kingdom workers to travel light, and he tells them, travel light as you go into the region of Judea. Specifically, the Lord tells them to carry no money belt, meaning it was like a purse, like what we would have, a, a wallet, to carry money. It says, don't, don't carry any money with you. Don't carry a bag with you, which was a knapsack that was used to carry supplies like food or clothing, much like our backpacks function today. And then he said, and carry no shoes, which doesn't mean that they were to go barefoot, but simply he means carry no extra shoes, just the shoes that you're wearing now. That's all. But then notice the last thing Jesus prohibited them from doing. He said at the end of verse 4, and greet no one on the way. Now, why would the Lord tell them this? Was he instructing them to be impolite so that they shouldn't give a casual hello? Hey there, how's it going? Is he saying you can't even give them a casual greeting as you pass by these folks on, on the road? No, the Lord's not saying that at all. He would never encourage any of his followers to be rude or ill-mannered. Just recently we studied in 1 Corinthians 13, love is not rude. So then what did he mean by greet no one on the way? Well, he was speaking to them in the context of the customary way that people greeted one another back then, especially in the Jewish culture. They would stop and they would engage in time-consuming and elaborate greetings that could actually go on for hours. And that's what Jesus is saying to avoid. He's saying avoid this lengthy type of extended greetings because they were on an urgent mission to spread the gospel throughout Judea, and therefore this wasn't the time for casual chit-chat. Do that another time, not now. Now the point, the point that the Lord was making in, in telling the 70 not to take any provisions with them as they entered Judea for their gospel spreading mission is that they were to learn to depend upon him as their shepherd to meet all of their needs. As one Bible teacher pointed out, he said the 70 were not only to trust the Lord to protect them from the wolves, but also to supply their basic necessities. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. So the question that we are faced with is, how do we apply this command to our lives? How far are we supposed to take this command? Are we required by God to refrain from taking any money or supplies on a short-term missions trip or any ministry endeavor for that matter? Tomorrow I'm leaving for an out-of-town pastor's conference. So am I to read this and, and assume that Jesus is telling me I should leave my wallet and extra clothes at home? Does this mean that whenever we send out a, a team on a missions trip or, or we send forth a missionary family, we tell them to take nothing but the clothes on their backs? Well, the answer to all of these types of questions is no. No. The Lord doesn't command us to leave all of our money and provisions behind while we are engaged in kingdom work because this command, this command that Jesus gave to the 70, it was unique and it was limited to these men for this particular ministry trip and that trip alone. And the reason we know this, the reason I'm saying this, this is not speculation. The reason I can say this is because of something we will read later on in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus said to his apostles. Here's what the Lord will say shortly before going to the cross. Luke 22, starting in verse 35. And he said to them, when I sent you out without money, without money belts and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? They said, no, nothing. And he said to them, but now, whoever has a money belt is to take it along. Likewise, also a bag. And whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. Now, what Jesus is referring to here, he's referring back to the 
short-term missions trip that he sent the apostles on into Galilee. That's the beginning of Luke chapter 9. That's this is exactly what he's referring back to. But it also, it also applies to the 70 being sent into Judea. The Lord asked the apostles if when he restricted them from taking any money, any supplies with them on their missions trip, it, he, he said, did you lack anything? And they said, no, nothing. Nothing. We didn't lack a thing. And then the Lord gives them a completely new set of instructions indicating that his original command of taking no money, no supplies, was never intended to be a universal command for all time. And the proof of this is that with his crucifixion, just around the corner, he tells the apostles to make sure they have enough supplies now ready to take with them. He tells them, take a money belt, take a bag, and even, even purchase a sword because things are going to get rough and you'll need all of this. In other words, when it comes to taking money and supplies with them, unlike before, they should do it now because a different set of circumstances means a different command. As John MacArthur explains, he says, as was, with the, as was the case with the apostles, this austerity for, for, was for temporary training purposes and it was not permanent. As Jesus later as his later reference to his sending the 12 indicates, the rigorous rules the Lord enforced during the initial training of both the apostles and the 70 were relaxed after it was completed. So then, if Jesus was not issuing a universal command here that's intended for all believers to obey every time we go on a ministry trip, then what is the timeless principle that he was conveying through this command not to take any supplies with them. So, in other words, how do we apply this to our lives? What principle is there here? Listen closely. The timely, timeless principle at the core of this command here in Luke chapter 10 is that all believers actively involved in serving the Lord need to learn that God can be trusted to supply all their needs. That's the principle. That's the truth. That is to say, the Lord wants all of his servants, us, to know that if we give ourselves to do his work, that we can trust him to take care of our needs. Folks, that's the principle. You can depend on your shepherd to care for you. This is the same truth that Jesus taught, taught his followers in the Sermon on the Mount to people who were filled with anxiety because they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. They didn't know if they would have cl clothes to, to weather the harsh elements. They didn't know if they could, could live with, without these necessities. And Jesus said this in response to his anxious followers. He said in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Do what I tell you to do and trust me. I'll meet all of your needs. But put me first. So the question is, do you trust him? Do you personally trust him to meet all of your needs? Listen, if you have trusted him for your eternal salvation, can you trust him to take care of your earthly needs now? And the answer is, of course you can. If he can save you for all of eternity, he can supply all of your needs now. It's just a matter of, of doing it, of believing him, that he is the good shepherd who not only laid down his life for you, but he's the good shepherd who will meet your needs and protect you and provide for you. This is exactly why I read to you earlier from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The thought here is because the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want because he's provided everything I need. Maybe not everything I want, but everything I need. And the reason you have no wants is because your shepherd loves you and he has promised to supply everything he feels and knows that you need. So folks, these instru instructions to... Our Lord's 70 kingdom workers, their instructions for us. So in obedience to the Lord, I exhort you. I exhort you to commit yourself to praying. Start praying that he'll raise up kingdom workers, missionaries, workers in church ministries. 
our own ministry here of children's ministry and other outreaches. And the question is, are you willing? You, you must be if you're going to be in, in submission to him. Are you willing to be an answer to your own prayers? Because he might raise you up to be one of these workers. And instead of worrying, which we all at times struggle with, will you begin to depend on Jesus to meet your needs? Think about how wonderful he is. Think about how great he is. Think about how strong he is. Think about how powerful he is. Is there anything too great for him? No, he can meet your needs. He promises, promises to provide all that you need as you give yourself to serving him. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord, then understand that your greatest need is salvation. It's to know him. It's to enter his kingdom. And that's, that's available. It's available to you if you'll simply turn from your sin, acknowledge your sin, repent of your sin, and turn to Christ and trust him alone for your salvation. The kingdom has come near to you because Christ has offered it to you. Thank you.